Okay, let's get started. This is the caller judgment session. My name is Clark Baker. I'll be the moderator. And uh, we are at Color Lab in Nashville, Tennessee. It's 2012, and it's the 39th Color Lab convention. The panelists here, on my left is Lottie Ainsworth. She's from Louisiana. I've never been there. She's been calling for 12 years, and she calls mainstream and plus mainly, and you can twist her arm, and she'll do a little bit of advanced maybe. Next to her is Lanny Weekland from Omaha, Nebraska. He's been calling for 27 years, and he also calls mainstream and plus mostly and does uh, some advanced calling also. And my name's Clark Baker. Um, I've been calling since 1977, and I mostly call um, C3 and C4 and a little bit of C2 and then going down C1 and advanced. And on occasion, I call plus. Um, this session uh, will stay it this way. Um, a square dance caller makes many decisions while we perform our jobs. And some of these decisions are pretty easy and obvious, especially to experienced callers. Others are not so easy, and different callers may make different decisions when presented with identical situations. Usually the results of a decision are minor or can be easily fixed. Occasionally, the decision has far-reaching consequences. As far as I know, Color Lab has never had a talk on this subject before last year. Perhaps we were afraid that it was too subjective and that we would be examining judgments, trying to rule them good or bad, perhaps with an eye towards somehow codifying judgments. That said, um, when we were doing the convention planning, we did put caller judgment on last year and had an interesting panel. And because of its ratings and stuff, we are holding it again with a different set of panelists to get a different set of viewpoints. I did find the following mention of good judgment in Jack Lazary's Notes for Callers from back in 1970. He's speaking about the new experimental call, Alter the Wave. He writes, I would advise using it from standard waves until the flow and pattern are well understood. It really dances nice, but use your good judgment in selecting the groups to present it to. And my point is, as I search in all the square dance stuff I can find um, about the word judgment or good judgment, then that phrase comes up occasionally to often. Um, and yet we never have a session on it or talk about it or how to develop it. So that's kind of why we're here today. Um, and let's see what we can do with that. I wanted to start with uh, some definitions. And I have all this on a handout, so I'm kind of reading from the handout. I'll give it to you in a little bit. And then there's a lot more participation we're hoping to do, um, both among the panelists and, and you guys. So what is judgment? And here are some definitions that seem applicable to our activity. Uh, judgments, the capacity to as assess situations or circumstances shrewdly and to draw sound conclu conclusions. Judgments, the cognitive process of reaching a decision or drawing conclusions. Judgment is the considered evaluation of evidence in the formulation of making a decision. And then contrast those words with some definitions of what a decision is. A decision is the act of making up your mind about something, and a decision is a position or opinion or judgment reached after consideration. So just like with all that stuff, it was beginning to sound a little circular. Um, we could flip a coin to make a decision. While the coin really made the decision for us, deciding that we're going to use the coin as the decision maker, that would be a judgment call. We want to be making good judgments, and the bulk of this talk will be a discussion of where good judgment comes from and how we develop it. Here are some definitions of good judgment I found online at a website called Answer Bag. This is good judgment. Having a sense of what's good or beneficial for yourself or others, that involves making a balanced decision weighing the pros and cons. 
and good judgment, it's what happens when all of the following intersect in a single moment. Experience, freedom from preconceptions and biases, thorough awareness of the exact details of the situation at hand, a concern for fairness and the welfare of all involved, and a willingness to take responsibility for choosing the consequences thereof. And that wasn't written for square dancing, but boy, it sure hits on a lot of our stuff. Um, And then a final thing is a question. Is good judgment the same as common sense? And this person wrote, no, because common sense is sound judgment not based on specialized knowledge. Much of our calling decisions are based on specialized knowledge. So the next part I want to cover is in our square dance activity, which is pretty broad and wide-reaching, especially as square dance callers, where are there opportunities? Where do we make decisions and need to have judgment about how to make those decisions? Most of the myriad decisions we make as square dance callers require some judgment. We use our experience, we weigh the pros and cons of taking action in one direction versus another, we make a decision, and then we head down that path. Often these decisions relate to choreography, and we'll spend some time talking about this. That Jack Lazary thing was a typical choreography thing. When should you introduce, um, alter the wave to your dancers, and which groups would it be a good idea, and which groups would it be a bad idea? Um... I don't want to just limit us to choreography discussions. There's lots of other places in our square dance careers where we make judgments. Um, And just running down a quick list, and then we'll kind of come back and and re-hit some of these. Um, Right off the bat, should you even accept a booking? How do you dress? How early do you arrive at the event? Do you have backups in case your equipment fails? How long a tip do you call? How long a break do you allow? What's your behavior to dance, both on stage and off stage? Are you engaged at the breaks, interacting with the dancers, and happy to be at their dance? Or are you outside smoking or talking on your cell phone? Your music selection. Do you use alternative music? What types of singing calls? What are the words in those things? What are the themes? What tempo do you use? How fast do you call? What's your entertainment style? Do you use yellow rocks, sexist words in your calling? Does it match the group you're calling for? We've had sessions on sussing the floor. Uh, How do you figure out what this floor can handle? How do you program an evening? When do you have a prepared program and then decide to uh, bail out on it because it isn't appropriate for the dancers who were there? And did you have a backup plan? What about after-party skits? We've certainly had some after-party skit sessions at Color Lab, often on Sunday nights, where some of the stuff presented becomes inappropriate and they were using bad judgment to present that material at our after-party. How do you come across an email, especially when you're upset? Yeah, use all caps. Um, (laughs) And then um, ethical decisions – And then the major ethical decisions you might deal with are spelled out in our code of ethics. There are no hard and fast rules for each of these decisions. Different callers will have different opinions, right? Remember, the goal here isn't to necessarily pick a situation and look at the judgment that was made and go, well, that was bad judgment, so none of us will ever do that again Um, because – If you don't know the goals, you can't necessarily judge how the judgment was good or bad. Um, Different callers have different opinions. One caller's opinion will vary area to area. What I might do in New England, I may not do when I'm on the road, or I may not do if I'm calling in Europe. What works in the United States may not work in Europe and may be different again in Japan. And then I had two other points on this section. Most judgments qualify as good or bad, mainly after some time has passed and the consequences of those actions can be measured. So in hindsight, we might know something, but we're only able to make that judgment and then the decision that it it, it causes in the moment. So you can't beat yourself up too much if you did the right thing at the time for what you knew, 
but later you discover that your knowledge was incomplete or, in fact, the situation was very different than what you had been led to believe. I have an example of that later. We make decisions based on the information available in the moment. Clark, you just said that. Okay, turn the page. Last part of what I want to present, and then we'll move on to our panelists. Um, there's a bunch of quotes I found on judgment, and there was one that I thought was especially apropos that's credited to Bob Packwood, Jim Horning, Fred Brooks, Oscar Wilde, and you've probably heard it. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. Let me read it once more. Good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. While experience, both good and bad, is a necessary ingredient, what is important is how you use that experience. You need to analyze the results of the decision reached and possibly modify your behavior in the future. Without this feedback loop, there's no learning and no change in your judgment. So the question we're looking for here in this session in general is presumably we all want to have good judgment. How do we attain that? And you've got to have experience and you've got to have introspection. So here's an example. You accept a booking to do a father-daughter dance for the Girl Scouts. The dance was difficult for you to call, and you couldn't wait for it to be over, pack up the equipment, and leave. If you fail to reflect on the decisions you made from accepting the booking, how you started the dance, the flexibility you had with the evening's program, and how you did crowd control, your demeanor at the mic, your judgment, and then you, if you don't reflect on that, then you're going to be doomed to repeat it. Your judgment isn't going to get better. I mean, maybe your judgment is simply never accept those bookings again. That might be good judgment. But um, one tool to help in this process is to write notes from each gig that you do. These notes would include what time you arrived, what time the event was scheduled to start, when it actually started, a description of the hall in case you're invited back to that same hall, uh, where you set up the equipment, how many people attended, what your program was, what you did for the first dance, when they took the break, how the experience, how experienced the dancers were, and any other important notes that you need so you can remember that if you accept another repeat booking from them, you know what you're getting in for and you're going to do better. I leave these things sometimes, um, and I just know how I could have done a better job. Um, I just called a dance for uh, the best buddies at a high school, which are these are um, – handicapped kids who are paired up with um, the general population in the school. And uh, um, they have dance parties, and they wanted to try square dancing. And because I'd been to the handicapable sessions that Michelle runs here, I had the guts to get up and accept that booking. And there were things they could do and things they couldn't, and it went well enough they invited me back. And, boy, I needed notes from that because a year later, I don't remember what worked and what didn't. Um, I now remember and from the notes, like Alaman left and Alaman right, arm turns didn't work very well. Elbow turns did. So the whole evening was, you know, face your corner, right elbow with your corner, or left elbow with your corner, back to the partner with a right elbow. Circles worked. You know, certain things worked. Dosa do was a loser. But I kind of still used it because some of the kids would just stand still and the other people would orbit around them, and it still kind of worked. But if I didn't have notes from that, I wouldn't be able to do a good job and build on what I'd done the first year to the next year. Um, if you tried to teach Grand Square, for example, to father-daughter square dance, I think it's rare that I ever do that. Um, and it happened to be a big mistake. Make a note of it so you know that you've improved and next time Grand Square just is a no-no at those kind of dances. The third component of developing better judgment is that of prediction. Were we to make a change, we need to be able to predict the results. In this way, we're always considering possible alternatives and choosing the one with the best predicted results. So the components of acquiring and improving your judgment are experience, you've got to go out and do stuff, reflection, you've got to think about what you did and how it worked, and prediction, you've got to be able to predict if I teach this call or if something like that happens, here's how I think it's likely to go. Judgments learned. The way we learn most things in life is through experience, followed by reflection, followed by an attempt to approve. Eventually, we can handle similar experiences without even thinking about them. 
In calling, we get plenty of experience. Every gig is an experience. Every tip, every call, did they do it, did they not do it? There's experience happening all the time. What we don't take enough advantage of is reflection. We need to think about what went well, what didn't go so well, and figure out what we would do differently next time. We also need to work on our prediction skills. For example, if you decide to teach a call to a group of dancers, you are predicting that they will be able to learn it in the short amount of time from your instructions. We've all been in situations where we've tried to teach something and it wasn't going very well. If we had the ability to predict that it wouldn't go well, perhaps we wouldn't have gone down that path. Maybe it was too late at night. Maybe we didn't have the right teaching words. Maybe the dancers didn't need to learn something new at the moment just to have fun and keep dancing what they already knew. We need to be able to predict the results of our actions. And that skill also comes from experience and reflection on that experience. And I drew all these ideas from a website I found um, on an article called How Managers Develop Judgment, Learning, and Action. And um, I have a handout, and you can go Google and find that and see other stuff that guy had written. I have more stuff to say, but I want to turn it over to our panelists, and uh, then we'll have some time and come back. Okay? Which of you would like to go first? Here we have Lanny. Good afternoon. Uh, a lot of the things that Clark said, uh, I'm going to repeat, but uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's nice to have two different views on the same subject. Uh, one of the things I, I kind of pride myself on is getting to a dance early. Knowing when a dance begins, knowing we expect to be there. If there's a round dance instructor I'm working with and, and my program does not start till 8 o'clock, I'm there at 7 o'clock to set up for the round dance instructor. What this does is it gives me time to talk to the dancers as they come into the door. I like to greet everybody as they come in. I also think that we should, as callers, if you talk to the, to the dancers, if you're going into a club that you have never called for before, before, you know nobody there, everybody is a stranger, how do you know what they can dance? How do you know if they have new students unless you talk to them? You need to talk to the people that come into the door. I pick out a couple couples. I said, do you have new students? Uh, how long have you been dancing? Uh, so and so, you can learn so much by talking to just to the dancers. They come in. If you, don't, if you don't round dance, I round dance, but I still talk to the people. Uh, you can figure out what they, what they can do uh, by just talking to them. Uh, yeah, because how soon do you arrive, you greet the people. During the dance, over the mic, how do you behave? Is it consistent with the values of the audience? Are you careful not to insult or degrade? Is the humor too consistent with the taste of, is the humor consistent with the taste of the audience? If you're nervous going into a dance and you have one person you find that you can pick on and they laugh and have a good time, you may be, you may be tending to overdo that sometimes. And we need to, I know I've, I've, I've learned that from judgment. I've done it. Uh, do you use gimmicks, special songs? How often do you use them? Is the third tip at every dance? If you use it the same thing, the third tip of every dance, maybe it's time to change. Keep things fresh. Uh, we, uh, we always go in. One of the things that is always when I first started calling 27 years ago, uh, one thing that bothered me was going to a new, new, a new dance where I've never called before and trying to figure out how good these people can dance. Can they dance what I can call or can I call what they can dance? And how do you do that? I figure out the first, the first tip. If I go to a new club that I've never called before, in my own judgment, I may have an accent. I'm, some of us do, right, Lonnie? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if I go to a club that I've never called before, I start off with a singing call and keep it very basic so they can get used to my voice. Then during the patter, if it's a mainstream dance, I call in a spin, I call a spin chain through. I call a tag the line. Things that, that maybe are Dixie styles, things that are maybe more difficult on our mainstream program. If they handle most of those things without any problem, I know I can call anything on the mainstream list that that I can do. If, if I want to try maybe the third tip, do something with a little non-standard applications, you know, half sashade stuff, if they handle that, 
you know, you can, the rest of the night you can call, but you have to be careful to call to the floor. Uh, I've always went with the rule, a very good friend of mine's name, Daryl Clendenin, and he said his, his main rule of the dancing was bend them, but don't break them. Keep everybody dancing. That's what we're paid to do. We are hired entertainers. We're supposed to keep these people dancing. Uh, Clark said, where do you go At the, on the breaks? Do you mingle? You know, do you greet people? It's very important to have the personal contact with every square dancer in the room. I try to make it a point to travel around and take everyone hands, thank them for coming. If they're round dancing, of course, you can't do that. But you need to make contact. These people came to your dance to dance to have a good time. You need to make sure they have a good time. And that's how we use our judgment, by visiting with them. Uh, don't go outside on the phone and talk. You know, do you check your emails during a dance? Turn that sucker off. It can't be that important. You need to talk to the people. If the audience is staying and lingering around at the end of the dance, do you stay and talk with them? Or can you just wait to get out the door, pack up your equipment, and leave? You know, these people came. You need to, you need to show them the respect and stay to talk with them. One other thing that, that's always been, I've had several new callers ask me how to handle this. It's a judgment thing. How do you handle when you have dancers, square dancers are fantastic people. They're so helpful. How do, you, how do you handle when somebody wants to come up and help you put your equipment away? We're all very protective of our equipment. We have to put it away a special way. You can't offend these dancers. They're just trying to be helpful. If you have a yak stack that's four foot in the air, you got a three foot, three foot ten guy trying to take it down. What happens? You know, you have to find a way to, to tactfully say, you know, that that's kind of tricky. I need to get that. You do not want to offend the dancers. They're trying to help you. Uh, social functions at a Christmas party or so. Alcohol, yes or no? You decide. Uh, you're doing a, a festival, an afternoon and an evening festival. And during the break, you go out with the dancers for the dinner. Do you drink alcohol? I would say no. But I have, uh, we had a caller in Omaha that came, came into Omaha, doing Omaha Festival, went out and had three bourbons, straight shots during dinner. And the dancers sat there in disbelief and watched him drink these and never, never booked him back. So, uh, well, his calling was about like it was in the afternoon. <laughs> Not going to mention any names. Uh, so our judgment, uh, the, the dancers see us as we're entertainers. They see us as entertainers. And more or less, they look up to a caller because we're on the floor. We're standing on the stage. They're doing what we're doing. They're having a good time. They're having fun. They're cutting up. Use your judgment. Do not offend anybody on the floor. The worst thing you can do is say, hey, Joe, turn around. You screwed up three or four times. You don't ever want to do that. But if you can just say, uh, sir, in the green shirt back there, turn around, you'd be much happier, and so would I. You know, they're going to they're gonna take that as a compliment because you, you didn't call them by name. Uh, when you're teaching classes, I'm kind of moving here because a lot of you will have some time. Uh, when you're, you're teaching a class, it's very important to teach the, 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 treat the dancers that are taking your, your lessons the same way. When the students come in the door, what are they talking about? Are they asking questions about the last session, session, trying to remember what they learned? Are they just quiet and interactive? They could be scared. You need to talk to them because I remember when I took lessons, my hands were sweaty the whole time. Uh, if they're relaxed and they're having fun and socially with others, it's a great sign of confidence. You know, warm your dancers up with what they've already learned. Don't hit them with something new the right off the gate. Let them dance for a while and get warmed up with what they did last week and the week before. Uh, if you teach us, if you teach lessons, which I've taught lessons for 27 years, ever since I started calling, you need to review every night what you've done the previous weeks. Dancers learn by doing. Some of them learn by reading. Some of them learn by showing. So when they learn by doing, we have to make sure that they, we let them do the call, learn the call, good judgment, let them relax and have fun. Uh, a little humor, you know, doesn't help. It helps, I mean, excuse me. It does help, sometimes. Uh, 
<laughs> if if uh, you know, uh, the students need to fe- have as much fun at lessons as they're going to have to at a dance. If we treat them treat them like a drill sergeant, they're not having any fun. Relax, have fun, use your good judgment, let them have fun. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. We're going to let uh, Lottie take over here, I believe, as long as her voice holds out. Well, I know some of y'all may have noticed that I'm taking pages and going, okay, he said that once or twice, and then he said that. So now I'm going to just read something that I wrote that maybe you boys did not say, and uh, maybe it'll touch someone in a way that'll affect you in some way or another. Oh, it sounds like, doesn't it? Um, One of uh, someone that I admire very much whenever I first started calling told me one time something that uh, stuck with me for a long, long time. Uh, They said to me that uh, um, anyone can call or teach. Anyone can be a caller or a teacher. But to call to uh, experienced dancers is something that's fairly easy for us as callers because they're good. They're good at what they're doing. And there's not too much that you can challenge them with because that's what they want. They want you to challenge them. They want you to do more and more. But it takes a real caller and a real teacher to teach to the lesser experienced dancers. And I pondered that forever before I figured out what they were trying to tell me. Uh, I was having trouble at some dances. It was like everything I called was stuff that was um, um, too hard for them. It wasn't too hard for them. It was the way I was presenting it to them. So I had to learn to, not what I call, but how I call it. So that made a lot of sense to me. I don't know if it does to any of y'all, but it did to me. Um, I think one thing as callers that um, I have found successful and also as a human being is treat people uh, like you want to be treated. Um, We're not callers and they're dancers. We're a team because if we don't have them... There's no need for us. So if you see anybody out there on the floor that's brand new or having trouble or not having any trouble and are just a really good dancer, go tell them. I mean, they're doing this because they want to. There's no need for you if, if, if we don't have them. And we're not having as many of them as we have had in the past. Uh, another quote that I heard from another caller that I admire a lot, it wasn't Clark or Lanny, um, says, there goes my followers, I must follow them, I am their leader. You must be their leader, if, and your job is to get behind them and gently push, not be so commanding and not be so I'm the boss and, you know, there's there's so many... All of us have a little bit of arrogance in our blood, um, except for Clark and Lanny, of course, and maybe some of the rest of us in the room. But one thing you want to do is, is know that if, if you put your big head on that night and you walk in there, you're not going to relate to the people like they want you to and like they need you to. And bottom line is they're not going to have any fun. And if you can't go there and you can't have fun, then you need to find another job. And I'm going to hush because I want some of y'all to have a chance to say something. So, um, is that a hint? So, I have a few examples. And generally, when I go to these talks uh, or any talk, I don't remember the subject super well. I remember remember the stories and the anecdotes that are told and what they – and from them, maybe you can relate back to the points of the talk. And um, I want to think of um, some examples and present some examples of bad judgment because I think – like if I think back in my life – at least the calling career, there's a couple of two or three things that just stick out strongly where I clearly did something that was bad, bad judgment. I learned from it, and it sticks with me for the rest of my life. So I'd like to relate one or two of those. And then I'm hoping that we'll hear some other examples like that that, 
you know, relate to different parts of what we've talked about, including maybe from some of you guys. Uh, and we have the wireless mic, so we have to, this is being recorded, we should all be on the mic. Um, one story is, um, I'm never a big, I attended a series of national conventions, but I was never a big fan of the dress code there and, and everything, and especially it's be, becoming relaxed and so forth. And I was at one, I don't remember which one, and I was dressed in shorts and a T-shirt, and it was during the day, and we're dancing and stuff, and I'm on stage to call in some hall. Um, and as I'm about to go up on stage, some caller looked at me like, you're going to call dressed like that? And I'm like, Yeah. So I got up and called my, you know, fast track mainstream or whatever it was and left. But it kind of stuck with me that I kind of used bad judgment that day. It was, you know, the hint I got was his shock that I was going to get up on stage and call like that. And actually one of the um, board members and a friend of mine took me aside one time, again at a national, and was like, you know, you're on the board. You're representing Color Lab. You ought to think about how you dress. And I'm like, okay, so from then on, you know, long pants, long sleeve shirt, whatever. But um, um, I think, you know, the person who talked to me was right, and the caller is, I was getting on stage was right. I was using bad judgment. I had a little point in my head that I was kind of making, but it wasn't the right thing. Um, go for it. Yep. I've always listened, went to the, the effect. Uh, I went to Frank Lane's Caller School. In 1985, if any of you have ever danced in, to, Clark, to Clark, Frank Lane, you know he was kind of a very strict, he was a drill sergeant. And I remember his exact saying, when you, when you came to the dance, the first day of lessons, he says, if you're not the best, the best dancer in your area, you shouldn't be here. And he says, if you're going to be a caller, dress like a caller. I went to dances where the people on the floor are dressed better than the caller. To me, that doesn't seem right. So if you're going to be a caller, dress like a caller. The other example I'll mention, and then we can, we'll can, move on from me. Um, I call at the New England Square Dance Convention, and they had a challenge hall. And in the earlier days, that was probably mostly what I called. So I spent a lot of my time in the hall, both calling and dancing. And... The floor level wasn't very good. Um, all weekend, I'd had to use my easiest cards. It was still had took work to get the dancers through it, spoon feed the material, stop and go delivery. Um, I think they were okay and entertained, but it wasn't a lot of fun for me. And um, as the convention was winding down, it ends up I was the last caller scheduled. You know, I was in the 10 to 11 o'clock slot at night, and then the convention ends, and we go to some other place and have the after-party dancing. And I decided, um, using my judgment, that I would call a final tip using harder C1 material, the stuff I wished I could have called all weekend. And we actually had a square of dancers who could do it, uh, we had some other dancers, too, who probably couldn't do it. But I announced that earlier, I said, you know, we're going to have the last tip be a harder tip. So, you, you know, you should be prepared for that if that's what you want to dance. And um, we had two squares. Uh, one did it, danced fine, had a great time. The other one stood the whole tip, didn't get anything. And... That might have been bad enough, but afterwards a man came up from that square, the one that stood, and told me that I'd ruined his entire convention. And he'd paid his money, and he deserved to dance. And I kind of, like, I'm, I'm good at having people come up and say things to me. Like, I try to take it in and not argue with them and all that. Um, but that comment, so I don't, don't think I argued with them. I might even have apologized. But as I packed up the equipment and drove off to the after party, I was crushed. It crushed all my enjoyment from doing it. I realized he was right. Um, and um, I didn't enjoy the after party because I was still processing how I'd screwed up and been a jerk. Um, so I used poor judgment calling an at speed harder tip at the end, even though it was pre-announced and the dancers knew what they were getting. Um, at the time, to me, my decision seemed like a good one. And maybe that's a point. None of us, I believe, intentionally make a bad decision. 
we're all trying to make good decisions all along, which makes it that much harder to realize that something we did in retrospect was bad. Because we were trying, I can give you the excuse of why I thought that was good. We always have the excuse. And um, while you guys were talking, I wrote down one thing that I didn't have in the talk is kind of ego versus good judgment. I think our ego or our arrogance can get in the way of good judgment. Um, you know, and it also can get in the way of, re of introspection. If you think you're the greatest thing on earth and just call it a wonderful tip, why should you ever consider whether anything was not correct or better or could be improved? So those are my two examples of at least two places where I've used bad judgment in my calling career. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have anything you want to add or say or give us an example from your career? <laughs> well, one thing, one thing that uh, bothers me a lot whenever I go to a weekend dance as a dancer is to have a, a lot of callers calling, and it's as if we are um, we're uh, competing against each other on stage, you know. Um, and I, as a dancer, picked that up before I even became a caller. So, and then I, as a caller, have a whole lot more knowledge of that, that that really is maybe what was happening. And uh, we, don't, we don't need to do that. Um, we have no points to prove except for the dancers having fun. I mean, we, we really, um, I don't think we have a point to prove. And if you do have some really good stuff that you wanted to share with that other caller and you wanted to call it that night, so that he could see it or she, well, then go ahead, but make sure that everybody's dancing. Cause I got this Louisiana thing going on. If everybody's not dancing, then everybody's not having fun. And sure, you're still getting paid the same money, and that's your dance, but you, you, know, you know, the, the people are not going to keep coming to you if they can't dance to you because you're up there competing with Joe. That's, that's ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. So... Um, and I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's head. I don't mean to by saying this. I just mean keep that in mind to let the dancers have fun because that's what it's all about. One of, one of the other things that, that uh, the dancers respect, you're a caller. They look up to you. If you taught these people to dance and you're at a dance and another caller's calling and you're there to dance, they feel very, very proud to have you in their square. Because I say, well, I always looked up to a new student that I've taught to dance, and they're in my square, and she's my corner, and says, you'll have to help me, because when you can't dance, they make you a caller. <laughs> you know, and, and so it, you have to put them at ease, and, that, and, and use your judgment with this, because these dancers, we need to let, make sure that they have a good time, uh, and judgment is everything. If you've only got two squares where you're hoping for ten, you should call the same dance you're going to call for ten squares that you would. You know, and you need it for two squares. You need to call the same dance. Don't change anything. You may be a little bit upset that you only got two squares. Maybe the weather was bad. I called a dance one night in Omaha when Desert Storm started. I was expecting ten squares. I had four. And they came in very, very quiet. You know, because they saw what happened on television. Everything was going on. And it makes a difference on what kind of music you play. So I didn't do a real rip-rousing dance that night. I did kind of a mellow dance where they can just kind of sit back, relax, chill out, and just have a good time. Uh, when things, when people, when things are of that nature that, that happen in our, in our everyday living or on their mind, it affects our dancers. It really does. They can forget most of it, but sometimes they still remember it during the breaks, and you have to watch what you do. Um, hi, uh, Bill Ackerman from Massachusetts. Uh, what Lottie just said. Um, in her her last round reminded me of something. This is about being up on stage with other callers and whether you compete with them and so on. If I'm literally competing with another caller, of course, I'm scared shitless and I won't do it. Uh, but there have been a couple of times when I've been up there with another caller who we were playing off each other and we were really well matched and having a great time. There have been a, two occasions when I remember that. We were just having a really great time with each other, tricking each other and so on and so forth. And it occurred to me afterwards... We're not up there to have fun with each other. We're not playing with each other. We're supposed to be entertaining those people. Were they entertained by all this? Maybe. Maybe not. 
Well, and I, and I think you're exactly right. I, I think one thing about that, though, if you can tell if they're having fun or not, and it is a lot of fun to call with another caller and to play off of each other's words or whatever, and as long as everybody's understanding you and your voices are not uh, competing with each other, then I think that's a great idea, but make sure they're having fun, too, like you said you did. Hi, Erin Byers from Sacramento, California. And forgive me because you heard part of my little speech earlier today. Um, one of the things that we have to remember is in this activity, we are the forever leaders. Club presidents come and go every couple of years. Association officers come and go. National convention chairmen, they do their thing there and then they step down. The callers and the cures are the ones that are here year after year after year. And when new people come into square dancing, they know nothing about our activity. They learn everything about what square dancing is supposed to be from you. Okay? And actually, it's kind of a fun experiment to watch new dancers at a dance and try to figure out who taught them to dance by the way that they dance. If they play around and act silly, Scott probably taught them how to dance. You know, if they're really serious, it might have been somebody else. But remember that in the end, you're the forever leader. And everything that you do, the dancers are either going to emulate or question. And the second thing is, I was already going to say this when Lanny was talking about calling the same dance regardless of the size. We used to stand around and go, oh, well, so-and-so's not here and that guy's not here. And we'd talk about all the people that didn't come. And then it occurred to me one day, I need to be concerned with the people who did come, who rushed home and had dinner and changed their clothes and got a babysitter or whatever they did and made an effort to come to my dance. Why am I wasting my time talking about the people who didn't do that? Because the only people that matter are the people who did. This is something Lanny Bob Maiden, St. Paul, Minnesota. Something Lanny said to us up in Minnesota at one time, he was talking about he had a square uh, that a club had brought, and they were breaking down in the back. He had come out and said that they were the best dancers in their dance. And they were breaking down and says, get somebody out there and dance with them to make certain they make it, and then they'll be with us. We went to our state convention the very first part of the morning, you have where the new dancers come in, they get a chance to dance at low-level dances. And it's not, it wasn't my students, but we had two dancers, and both squares were breaking down. They were new dancers, and they just kept breaking down. So it's the, what Janine and I did is we went down and danced with them, even though they weren't our dancers. Because it's like, Lanny says, if they're not allowed to succeed, they're not going to be with us. And that's something. Claudia Amsbury from Spokane. You were all dancers before you were callers, and I think that when you're out on the floor, you can benefit from other callers' judgment. Sometimes you learn how to, and sometimes you learn how not to. One thing I'm going to jump in right for Jim Uh I've had callers come up to me and say, newer callers, that I go to their dances when they call because they're, they're nervous. They're very nervous. They say, come off the stage at the end of the dance. They says, how do I know if I called a good dance or not? I said, did you have fun? He said, oh, I had a ball. I said, don't worry about it. The dancers had fun too then. If you don't have fun, the dancers aren't going to have fun. So you have to make sure in your judgment you call the songs that they like, if they, if you know that this certain person likes uh, Jose, I got a girl up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that every time I'm up there, I get the request to do Jose. And I remember, she doesn't have to ask me. Call her adjustment, you remember, they ask you, always play the favorite songs if you can. Uh, Jim, <laughs> Jim Wass, Riverdale, Maryland, and uh, for those listening to the recording, Clark Baker is sprinting side to side across this 30-foot floor because of the way the people raise their hands, the sequence we did it in. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you, you talked earlier, Clark, about the uh, use of the Grand Square at the father-daughter dance. That one I've never done, but uh, I had this uh, wonderful church retreat going at a hotel, 
And they, after we did the half grand square, no reverse, we did the half grand square, high-fiving, congratulating each other, t- getting each other's autograph. They were just so proud and so pleased. Uh, Anne warned me. She was sensing. I did the reverse, deflated for the rest of the evening. It was a totally different evening after that. There were many things I could have done instead of that. So let me pick another one from, whoops, let me pick one more of mine and I'll be back and get you. Um, This is the one that got me suggesting this talk to the board. This piece of email came in. um, And uh, in early 2010 on one of the Square Dance discussion threads, uh, the title was Square Dance Attrition. And different points of view had been offered and different callers had their opinions and stuff to say. Um, Bernie... I don't know how to say Bernie's last name. Colthurst? Yeah. Uh, He's the former board chairman of Legacy. He responded to one viewpoint with the following. This goes on for a little bit. He says, I don't think it's a matter of dancers getting their money's worth. It's a matter of having fun, feeling wanted, and not have to dance the cutesy calls that so many callers call. Many callers think that they are self-appointed to teach the dancers something at every dance. Dancers hate workshop sessions at a dance. Callers are entertainers, not educators at a dance. We were at a dance last Sunday, and a caller called a fractionalized grand square. She killed the floor. I'm hoping this wasn't you. (laughs) I approached her after the tip, and she said fractionalized calls are legal according to Caller Lab. Later in an email message, she justified her calling a fractionalized grand square by comparing it to eight chain through and square through. I responded that these fractionalized calls are taught in most beginner dance series, but a fractionalized grand square is not. She has replied. I told her that she's supposed to be an entertainer and not an instructor at a club dance. She responded that she is not an entertainer and she does what she does because she loves the activity so much. B.S. Maybe we should ask the dancers why they don't come to square dances. You may get a mouthful, and you may not like what you hear. I could give other examples of cutesy calls, but I will not waste your time. It boils down to what we are selling the dancers. It boils down to what we are selling the dancers are not buying. We are selling Edsels instead of focused vehicles. Um, So... There's a lot of discussion stuff we could talk about. We could do, like, spawn sessions off of each of those points. With respect to our subject, here's some areas I think it's worth thinking about. What do dancers want or expect at a club dance? That's a judgment call. Is teaching something, like a new call or improving on something or telling them how to do fractionalized load the boats or something, is that appropriate at a club dance? Is fractionalizing Grand Square a good workshop idea? Is it proper even to fractionalize Grand Square? How did the caller, how did this caller respond when an upset dancer approached her? Why is she or you or me in a leadership position at dances? Should callers try to figure out why dancers don't come to square dances? So my experience says teaching fractionalized Grand Square at a club dance was probably a bad decision especially given the above email. It would be interesting to hear the caller's side of the story and find out if she would make any changes in the future. She wouldn't. Okay. I don't know if she would or not. That wasn't me. <laughs> I'm, I'm Hal Barnes from Bowie, Maryland. Gosh, I had a comment, and now Clark's got me all fired up about his, his, his thing. Um, the... Uh, uh, and I would like to make a comment about it. I think there is a great diversity among callers, and in an area, that's a good thing because not there is no average dancer, okay? So there are some dancers who want to dance the same dance every single time because they don't want to have to think they've told me that, and they just love that, and they go to callers who call that way. There are other callers who like a little bit of a challenge. My philosophy is absolutely opposite from the email because I hope that every dancer who comes to my dance 
is a little better dancer when they leave than when they came. It's not that I workshop all night, but I do things a little differently. And so over time, their dancing ability generally gets better. Some people don't like to dance to me because I make them think. But they'll go to somebody who calls the same dance all the time. And I think that's healthy. Don't make us all the same because the dancers aren't all the same. They have different They have different needs. But anyway, I, let, me, let me go back to the how I screwed up, okay? Um, I have learned painfully that whenever my emotion is I'm angry, I'm going to make a bad decision. And the one that comes to mind where I learned this lesson most painfully was when I was calling for a club, and uh, I'd never called for before, and they said, we have a star tip, an advanced uh, advanced tip kind of near the end. And, and I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't call advanced, but I do a pretty good plus DBD. Would that be acceptable? And he says, okay, that will be fine. And he gets up and announces as follows. This caller can't call advance, so we're going to we're gonna do uh, – so we're going to have to do a, a, a plus DVD. I, I, I just – I just immediately – I just saw red. I was just – I mean, I was – it was such a put down. So I was – I was angry, okay? And, and, of course, you shouldn't call in a state. You shouldn't drive and, and call. And so, you know, you can imagine what I did. My first, I, I, to this day, I remember my first sequence, okay? Heads past the ocean. Trade the wave, extend, which was left-handed, and relay the deucey, which was left-handed. And the whole floor collapsed, and I thought, got him. Well, yeah, guess who was the loser there? Um, I'd like to go back to something that Clark said just a minute ago, not, to, not that this topic is not pretty good here but um he said something about workshops and dancers liking workshops or not liking workshops i've ran into a lot of problems recently with workshops i don't know if y'all have or not um you're hired for a weekend or uh for a saturday and then saturday night dance and uh you know um the the people that are the dancers and callers that are putting on the the weekend may have uh, workshop scheduled. This uh, a, a little while ago, uh, I was doing a, a weekend dance, and on Saturday they had workshops all day long scheduled, all day long, all day long, from nine o'clock in the morning to um, four o'clock in the afternoon, and then we had to all be back at six. Now, I was not doing all of that. Thank you, Jesus. They had me doing some of the workshops, but some of the other call, the local callers were helping out to do, the, or the area callers were helping out to do the workshops. Um, Friday, uh, Friday night, we had 25 squares. Saturday night, we had 37 squares. Saturday, during the day, we had one square doing workshop all day long. Uh, well, I take that back. There was a plus hall that had two workshop, two two squares. Now the dancers are speaking. Why won't we listen? And it's not that I just hate workshops, but if they don't want to come and they don't want to, and and a lot of the reasons they don't want to come is not that they don't want to learn anymore. It's because they want to pace themselves. That we're older. A lot of us are, and we want to be able to make it through the night and you know at nationals you have to pace yourself or else you will fall apart before it's over so I, that's just my little you know bit i was going to say one other thing uh my my experience with workshops this is my own judgment is a lot of the dancers don't want to do a call to have you teach them a call that they may never hear again they're going to spend 20 minutes learning a new call that they're going to dance for five minutes and it's going to be forgotten. So why not take the program you're, you're calling? If you're calling plus, what is the one of the toughest calls on the plus call, on the plus list? It's not relay the deucey. In my estimation, it's not spin chain the gears. It's not spin chain the ga- exchange the gears. It's anything and roll. It's probably the toughest call. When I do a plus workshop, I do a weekend up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I work on anything and roll. You can explode and roll. You can partner partner trade and roll, uh, trade the wave and roll, cut the diamond and roll, flip the diamond and roll, bend the line and roll, and girls peel off to a right and left ground. That kills them. But they do it the second time. 
So do at a workshop, do something that that's on the program you're 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 calling. Don't go out and pick up scoot and relocate that they may not ever want to do. Grand spin. Grand spin. Well, that's that. People like that. You know, I danced that for thirty years. I don't ever want to dance it again. Hal mentioned being angry, and do other people have problems occasionally with being angry, maybe while at a dance or I know I don't. in a situation? I never do. Okay. <laughs> are, are you willing to give me five minutes to talk about anger for a second? Okay. Here's... Here, I read this article. This is my daughter is a student at Northeastern, and in their magazine, they had an article on anger. Um, this is in the psychology department, and um, he motivated it in a way related to health care and all that that is not important for us. But he says when you study emotional states, you'll see how much they act like shortcuts, pushing us to make quick calculations in response to threats or opportunities. That's often a good thing, sometimes even a life-saving thing. Think fight or flight kind of stuff, but not always. Anger, in particular, affects the mind in three distinct ways, which prepare us well for combat, but they don't necessarily help us conduct a rational debate or perhaps rationally calling dances. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here are the three things that anger does to our brain psychologically. One... It causes us to overestimate the odds that further frustrations are lying in wait for us, all too ready to trip us up sometime in the future. If you and your spouse just had a big argument, you've also become convinced you're going to be passed over for a promotion, cheated in a deal, stuck in traffic on the way home. Objectively, nothing in your life has changed to warrant those views, but the anger has altered your perception that way. So that's one thing, is it, okay? And that's bad. Then um, the second way is it makes us less careful. Certain emotions, such as sadness, can prompt us to proceed cautiously and thoughtfully. Anger, on the other hand, often causes us to think less prudently about what we're considering. Perhaps the next call, the next sequence, the you know, who knows. It can push us to go with our initial hunch and make snap decisions. It's a good evolutionary thing, but it may not be the right thing, you know, for us. And then the third one, and most insidious, anger can produce or intensify our prejudice about individuals we perceive as different from us. Whenever you focus your attention on an object or a person, your mind makes a rapid automatic evaluation. Chocolate cake, good. Cockroach on the chocolate cake, bad. Your friend, good. Your enemy, bad. Sometimes you don't know much, something you don't know much about neutral. That is, unless you're feeling angry. When you're angry, encountering people different from you, even if they're different in a very subtle way, amps up your brain's negative response. And in this particular lab, they did an experiment where the only difference between the two groups is they had them put on either a blue wristband or a red wristband, and they got the groups kind of worked up and angry, and they asked them to make judgments about, like, who you'd hire or who you'd do something with. And sure enough, the people with the red red bands wouldn't hire the blue red band people just because all they were wearing was that blue red band. So anger does those three things to us. And it's hard to control anger, but it's great if you can because you've got to realize those things are happening while you're angry. Okay, that was a diversion. Back to the regularly scheduled program. Does anyone have – I'll come to you, Aaron. I'm looking for more like, boy, I had bad judgment and I'm willing to talk about it type stories. Oh, Brian Clark. A paragon of good judgment. Well, uh, yeah, Brian Clark from Vancouver, Canada. Um, so, uh, of course, the only reason I'm here is it's a it's a subject of me being a member of Colorado Lab. I was required to come to this session. Um, <laughs> and they told me at the door, otherwise I couldn't come. Anyways, um, I, I've had a career of, of bad decisions, and, and, of course, what that does is it gives you experience, uh, of which I have a lot of experience. Um, you know, uh, I came from an environment where we learned how to compete in square dancing, and that's unlike the rest of the world. And so when I w was let out amongst all of the 
uh, mainstream uh, dancers out in the real world. As a caller, I, I couldn't quite understand why this group of mainstream dancers couldn't do a three-quarter Zoom. Or, you know, they couldn't do some of the stuff that I was calling to them, which if I was calling to the teen groups, they would dance it with no problem at all because we had practiced it and we know how to do that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so throughout my career, I was able to call some of the weirdest stuff. But what that did for me was it, was it made me study what a lot of the other callers did and see what they do and understand how they make things successful. And, and, of course, the end result of it is me doing a presentation here about choreo buildup, which seems sort of weird because normally I would just start with the hardest thing and go on. But over the years, I just I learned how to, how to sort of curb that and actually get a lot more success out on the floor, which has made me a lot more popular, which is handy. So here's what we're going to do for the rest of the day. Uh, we're going to let Aaron speak, and then you guys can have some concluding remarks, and I have just a little bit to say. Sorry, if I'd known, I would come up with a story. But when Clark was talking about anger, if we are doing our jobs correctly, and some of you know I'm not just a caller's partner, I'm a cure. If we're doing our jobs correctly, then we are emotionally invested in our performance. Okay? And even more so for a caller who is performing a singing call and actually giving out those emotions. But even me, I need to be able to, you know, be happy and bouncy on a cute little two-step, but then when it's a rumba, I need to be a little sexier. So we're all emotionally invested in what we're doing. So when somebody comes to us and says, you know, says, oh, well, you know, you're not very good at that, the first reaction is an emotional one because that's the, that's the way that we're performing that evening. So it makes it doubly hard to deal with um, somebody upsetting us or sliding us or making us angry because we were sitting on an emotional kind of roller coaster already. So it's you have to be extra, extra careful to guard yourself. One other thing. Uh, this is just a little... Uh, personal thing that I that I always like to do and and make sure uh, it, it sounds like I'm preaching but I'm not trying to preach these are things that I think that all callers you probably all do this uh, make sure you compliment the dancers tell them they did a good job we all like to get patted on the back when I call in Kansas uh, if I've got 12 14 squares of dancers at the end of the dance, every dancer comes up and goes through the line to thank the caller because, you know, they had a good time. But, but you have to compliment them the same way they, that they compliment you. Uh, I think my final remarks want to be that uh, in your calling, whether it's getting your uh, – if you've already prepared for that night – and you get there and things are not working out the way you planned, uh, just think about keeping a positive attitude. Be flexible. Be ready to change at the drop of the hat. Have a backup, you know, have a backup plan. If there's a lot of stuff that you've worked on for two or three weeks, maybe at home, and you, you want to go and you want to do it out on the road, if some of you do call out on the road or whatever, um, you know, have a backup plan and doesn't, don't let that ruin your night or your attitude. Uh, I know I, I when I first started, I would work hard, hard, hard on stuff. And I'd get out there and I'd think, well, you know, this works really good at home. And everybody was really having fun with it. But we're not really having fun with it here. Susie and Joe just got out of class. And Susie and Joe paid the same money that everybody else here did. And not just two people. But these people want to have fun. So let's not go there because I wasn't experienced enough to present it to them that they could have a good time. Now, as the years go on, you learn to present it to them so that even, you know, some of the uh, brand new people can take some of the stuff that you have. But just be ready to, to change if you have to and keep a positive attitude while you are, while you are calling. And that will keep you from being mean and getting mad. <laughs> keep you from being mean and getting mad. One, one more thing here. If you do choreography, a lot of choreo, I, I write choreography as I drive in a car to dances. I drive a lot of times to Denver, which is five. It may not be good. I don't text. 
But what you what the choreography you write on paper may look, oh, that's fantastic. They're just going to love this. It's just going to go. And you go to the dance, you try it, and they go flat on their face. Don't beat a dead horse to death. Let it go. It may not be as good as you thought it was. It works on paper. Don't. May, it may not work on the floor. We, we aren't here to really judge judgment. Rather, we've provided some ideas on what judgment is and how to develop yours. Obtaining and approving your square dance judgment is based on experience, reflecting on the experience, and honing your ability to predict the outcome of your decisions. I'll leave you with a point that Jim Mayo made to me. We can't talk about judgment without defining the objectives. There is not general agreement about many of the aspects related to calling a dance. For example, what kind of choreography and delivery are most dancers looking for in order to have fun? And if we don't agree on our goals, how can we develop judgment for the decisions used to reach those goals? And that's kind of the end of my talk. But Jim's point's a tough one. Um, we might think we're headed somewhere, and he can look. He can write down what type of. I mean, we know we all don't agree on uh, the goals in calling a dance because we're all so different. And do we want more calls on mainstream? Less? Do we want to call mainstream harder, easier? To Hal's point, we shouldn't all be homogenized. I mean, there are differences for good reasons. If every caller were Vic Cedar, it would be a boring world. But it's good we have the Vic Cedars in the world. Um, so. Um, We have to look at where we are right now with the people in front of us and figure out what we can best do to, to entertain them using our skills and then think about what happened and improve and move on. Keep on keeping on. So I thank you for your attention and thank you to the panelists.